The man is pounced upon by the grass-covered zombie, and without a weapon, he's a little hard to fight. Negan grabbed a steel rod on the ground to fight back. After finishing the zombie, Negan suddenly felt an itch on his right arm. Rolling up his sleeve, he discovered a rash spreading across his arm. Something seemed to click in his mind. Negan was about to warn Aaron to be cautious, but Aaron shot him a menacing look. Aaron didn't care if the zombie was killed or not. He just wouldn't allow Negan to have a lethal weapon in his hands. Then Aaron threw the handcuffs over to Negan and ordered him to cuff himself. This was perhaps the most humiliating moment of Negan's life, where he found himself humbled and diminished, trying to change and adapt, only to face this outcome. So this time Negan refused. For the sake of his last bit of dignity, Aaron even took out his knife and showed a fierce look, like I will do it if you don't do it. Now Negan got angry, he addressed Aaron, what's your problem? I've been busting my ass for you guys all day. Aaron retorted with anger, do you really care about us? If you did, you'd leave Alexandria safe zone. That's what everyone wants to see. Negan hurt a lot of people, but he won't admit he was wrong. It's all about keeping more people alive, just in different ways. He thought that Aaron's boyfriend's death wasn't his fault, but rather Aaron's failure to protect him. That hits Aaron even harder, he doesn't want to admit it. So he uses the same theory on Negan, if I failed my boyfriend then what about you your wife's death was your fault too. She hated you till the day she died. Negan's expression grew serious. No one could bring up his wife like that. You wanna say something? Yeah. Behind you. Just as Aaron had finished off one zombie, another pounced on him. He barely managed to keep it at bay. When he finally pushed the zombie away, he felt an intense burning sensation in his eyes, as if they were on fire, struggling to open his eyes. All he could see was blur and darkness. After five minutes Aaron's eyes were close to blindness and he could only see a little bit of light. Aaron heard the sound of Negan escaping and followed it to this location. Luckily there was a house here, otherwise it would have been very dangerous in the woods. Aaron was able to stumble into the house by the blurry light. Unable to see, Aaron gets anxious and tries to find a safe place to sit down. Unbeknownst to him, Negan was quietly watching Aaron from the couch. Aaron is moving around the house, making noises from time to time. Soon outside the two zombies were attracted to the house is a little close to the house. Aaron heard the hissing of the zombies and hurriedly touched the wall to the door. He was ready to lock the door, but he was one step too late. The zombie crashed through the door and advanced toward Aaron. At that moment, Aaron felt a wave of panic unable to see. He instinctively stepped back to avoid the zombies. His punches swung through empty air. As the zombie gets closer, Negan makes a move. Negan smiles a familiar smile. In that moment, it seemed as if the former tyrant had returned. You all right? Aaron nodded his head. He was worried that Negan would hit his head with a stick. Negan slowly approached, then crouched down without attacking Aaron. Many things had lost their meaning for the current Negan. Negan explained to Aaron that the plants growing on the zombies were called pigweed. Contact with them could cause eczema or even blindness. Resting may be able to recover. Negan then helped Aaron up and let him sleep on the couch. Where are you going? I'm gonna keep watch. We'll leave first thing in the morning. I mean, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Can you say me? Yeah. Good. Meanwhile, Michonne and the others who had gone out for negotiation finally found a school where they could rest. They hadn't slept for two days and nights. Afterward, armed with weapons, they began to inspect the school, though the place was in shambles. There were no signs of zombies. While walking, Carol seemed to kick something on the ground. Pick it up and see it's a book about house sitters. Carol was in a bit of a trance as she looked at it. The written cover changed. Carol was carrying food and there were five children sitting around her. Sophia, Lizzie, Mika, Henry and Carl. Everyone has a blood mark on their neck. It was incredibly eerie. Carol's emotions became unstable as she looked at the book. Fortunately, Daryl came over in time to call her, snapping her out of the trance. They entered a classroom shortly after. Carol suggested that she would take the first watch until it was time to change shifts. Michonne's suspicions were right. Carol was indeed experiencing hallucinations. Ever since coming off the fishing boat and learning about the Whisperers, Carol's mind had been consumed by thoughts of revenge. Nightmares plagued her sleep. To stay awake, 
Carol started taking medication, making sure she remained alert at all times. The symptoms became more obvious after two days of killing zombies without rest. Half an hour later, Carol sensed some movement outside. She grabbed a flashlight and proceeded to the hallway to investigate. It's very quiet here, the slightest movement can be heard. As Carol reached a corner, she noticed a door with traces of bloodstains. Cautiously, she peered inside, finding a room in disarray, covered in blood. In the corner, a set of skeletal remains indicated that someone had been dead for quite a while. Carol saw nothing unusual and turned to leave. However, Mom? Mom? Carol woke up with a start and wondered if it was a dream or a hallucination. Daryl came over and asked Carol where she had been and why she had been out for half an hour. Carol awkwardly mentioned she was on patrol. Daryl looked at Carol with a strange expression, sensing that something was off with her. He didn't press further and walked away. But at that moment, a figure appeared outside the window. Carol hurriedly followed. Eventually Carol had followed the figure all the way to the basement door. Chains were swinging on the door. Approaching cautiously, Carol saw a woman's figure with her back turned to her. It was a truly eerie and terrifying sight. Carol wanted to check if it was a zombie or the whisperers, but within a few steps the figure disappeared. And then, the trap was triggered and Carol was hanging upside down in midair. The figure reappeared, staring at her intently, remaining composed. Carol retrieved a knife from her waist, attempting to cut the rope that held her, but after all, she was too old to do so. At that moment, the figure approached her. Carol swung the knife, but the figure evaded her attack. It was clearly a member of the Whisperers. The Whisperer doesn't rush to do anything, but turns away, because there are already zombies coming in. With zombies closing in, Carol grew anxious. She fired her last bullet, a gunshot sure to draw help. But before that, Carol had to save herself, summoning her survival instinct. She finally managed to cut the rope. Carol fell to the ground, injuring her left arm in the process. Now that she's out of trouble, it's not a big deal to get rid of the zombies. Five minutes later, Carol had dispatched all of them. Daryl and the others arrived shortly after. They proceeded to return to Alexandria's safe zone overnight. On the way back, Carol had already slipped into unconsciousness due to her injuries. Siddick promptly examined her wound. Glass shards were embedded in her flesh. He instructed Dante to hold the glass fragments while he carefully used tweezers to extract them. Seeing the bloody wound, Siddick's mind once again recalled the scene. Dante noticed Siddick's worsening condition and offered to take over. After a while, Carol's wounds were treated and she was fine, but she passed out. Daryl thought it would be a good thing for Carol to get some sleep. As the day wore on, the sky began to lighten. Outside the north gate, zombies are piling up all over the place. Eugene and Rosita had battled all night, leaving them physically and mentally exhausted. They sat in chairs, taking a moment to rest, gathering his courage. Eugene confessed, I've been protecting you out there because I care about you, Rosita. Before he could finish, Rosita interrupted with a question, do I need your protection? After all, you learned your fighting skills from me. This is so heartbreaking. Eugene choked up. He had believed that by staying by Rosita's side and protecting her, he would eventually win her over. However, all his efforts had seemingly been in vain. He realized it was time to let go. In reality, Rosita had rejected Eugene before, but he hadn't listened. From this point on, Eugene resolved not to pester her any longer, preserving his last shred of dignity. The same message goes out to those of you watching, let go when it's time, because it's not worth it. This experience shattered Eugene's heart. He decided to find a place to contemplate the path he should take in the future. Eugene was truly unfortunate. Rosita and Siddick had a relationship and a child. Rosita and Siddick split up. And now Rosita was with Gabriel. But Eugene had given everything for nothing. Carol woke up, feeling this was the best sleep she'd had lately. Then Carol came to the ground floor. Michonne was already here. Seeing Carol unharmed, Michonne felt relieved. Michonne believed that Carol's experience from last night had been a result of hallucinations. There were no actual whisperers trailing them, and Carol's arm injury was self-inflicted. Carol didn't bother to defend herself against these claims. After a while Carol found Daryl. She wanted to ask if he didn't believe her too. Daryl, smoking a cigarette, replied perfunctorily that he did. But Carol understood that everyone thought it was just her hallucination. Carol had actually seen it last night. The whisperers were stabbed by her and fled finally escaping into the distance and dying under a tree.